One of the questions that I receive most about women's issues is the verse 434, the verse that is unfortunately deeply misunderstood from Muslims and those who are not Muslim, who ask about women's rights, especially in the space of the sanctity of the home. And oftentimes verse 434 is translated in a way in the English translation that is very difficult to process as a believing woman or as a believing man who uh, doesn't condone any sort of domestic violence. And so unfortunately, because there is a misunderstanding on the translation of this verse at times or the meaning of this verse, Muslims get confused on what it could mean. How do we explain it? And oftentimes we hear things like justification, such as, um, you know, well, it's okay as long as um, you don't actually beat someone. And all of that is so far from what the Quran actually shares with us in terms of what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um, prescribes, what God prescribes for men and women to have a peaceful home that is filled with tranquility and love and mercy. The Quran talks about marriage as a place of love and mercy. It talks about uh, um, dwelling with one another in tranquility. How does that example of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, who had the most incredible relationships with um, the mothers of the believers in every single way, whether it was a physical, emotional, sexual, intimate relationship in every single way, that example was one of of, of joy. It was one of healing. It was one in which women were heard. Where do we understand that ideal for what it looks like in a marriage when it comes to this verse. And what does the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, teach us when it comes to the idea of woman, leaving, woman living in a way that honors her autonomy, in a way that honors her, her individuality in the space of a partnership, of a relationship. So to begin, let's look at what the verse actually starts with. The Quran says, A'udhu billahi min ash-shaitan rajim rahman rahim the والتي تخافون نشوزهن فعذوهن فعذوهن واهجروهن في المضاجع واضربوهن فإن أطعنكم فلا تبغوا عليهن سبيلا إن الله كان عليا كبيرا and let me read a translation for you. Men are the caretakers of women, as men have been provisioned by God over women and tasked with supporting them financially. And righteous women are devoutly obedient and, when alone, protective of what God has entrusted them with. And if you sense ill conduct from your woman, advise them first. If they persist, do not share their bed. But if they still persist, then discipline them gently. But if they change their ways, do not be unjust to them. Surely God is most high, all great. Now, without context, without commentary to understand the meaning of what every single part of that long verse means, it can cause a person a pause. So let's talk about what most of the parts mean, only because every part would take hours. So we're going to take some of the ones that generally cause the most confusion. The beginning that men are caretakers of women. The verse is using the word qawwam. Qawwam can be used for men or for women. For example, in another part of it of, of the Quran, there are two different verses in which Allah says, Ya amanu kunu. And the verse continues, and there's another ayah very similar to it with slightly different words, but also using the word qawwam. And that is standing up for justice. Be persistently standing up for justice. So we know that the word qawwam is included with this idea of standing up, of um, someone who strengthens, strengthens something. 
Raghib al-Isfahani, he was a scholar of our past, mentions that Qawwam in this verse is talking about a protector, a strengthener, um, someone who gives support. And that's the same thing that Ibn Ashur mentions, someone who stands by and supports something. And specifically for men, Al-Qurtubi mentioned that men provide alimony for women and defend them. So when we're looking at the beginning part of this verse, some scholars believe that it means that all men are qawwam for all women. All men are supporters, defenders, caretakers of all women. Other scholars, like Al-Qurtubi, for example, mentions that it's specifically for husbands and wives. That this verse isn't talking about all men and all women, but specifically in the role of marriage, considering the context of the verse, that it means that husbands are financial, emotional, caretakers, supporters of wives. Why? Now, in order to understand all the other parts of this part of the verse, we actually need to do a tafsir of different verses. Because in order to get bima fadlullahu baldlahu ma'ala bald, we have to look at a verse two verses before. So we're not going to do that today just because we don't have the time. But we're going to go to the next part, which is وَبِمَا أَنْفَقُوا مِنْ أَمْوَالِهِمْ And in order to understand this part, we actually still need to take another verse. And that is the end part of an ayah in Surah Al-Baqarah where, where Allah says وَلِلْرِجَالِ عَلَيْهِنَّ دَرَجَةً So upon um, men, so over, men, over women, men have another degree. What is that other degree? What does daraja mean? They have another level? They have another degree of what? Of responsibility towards women. What is that responsibility? Ibn Abbas mentions in what men give to women in the mahar and in financial provision. And this is super important to remember when we talk about this part. Wabima and faqu min amwalihim and what they give out of their wealth. So the Quran says in verse 434 that men are qawwam over women. Why? One of the reasons is because of what they give to women over their wealth. Now, part of the, one of the, the problems, not problems, but a structural issue when we're looking at marriages where men are the only, uh, where men are solely responsible for the finances when it comes to domestic violence is that women are completely reliant on her husband for her sustenance, for her shelter, for her food, for her clothing, for that of her children's. If she is in a finance, if she is in a uh, emotional, physical, sexually dangerous place and she's being harmed, she often has to choose between having nowhere to go or staying and continuing to experience the harm. And especially if she has children, Leaving that situation with nowhere to go, especially when I've had women come to me and tell me that their own families do not want them back because a divorce is such a big stigma in their culture. And that's not something we see during the time of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. The companions of the Prophet, peace be upon him, would get divorced simply because they didn't get along with their spouse. Just because they were not emotionally compatible just because they didn't really feel like they loved each other, which of course, that's not to say we shouldn't encourage therapy and we shouldn't encourage support systems. But the point is it wasn't a stigma. Companions of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, would get married, divorced, widowed, and remarried. And that was the case of Asma bint Umais, who was a huge companion, radiallahu anha, who when Umar radiallahu anhu went in and saw that she was sitting with Hafsa, his daughter, radiallahu anhum, and he was like, who is this? To Hafsa. And Hafsa was, and then he realized, oh, she's the woman who came with the ship because she migrated from Mecca to Abyssinia. And then she migrated from Abyssinia to Mecca. I mean, excuse me, to Medina. And Omar radiallahu anhu told her that we got here first. We migrated with the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, before you did. And that's not his exact, his exact statement. But his point was that we have more of a right to the Prophet than you do. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And she is looking at Omar radiallahu anhu, who is physically a very large man, who is guaranteed paradise, who is a commander, who becomes the Khalifa of the Muslims. And yet she doesn't say, oh, I shouldn't say anything back because he is a man. She doesn't say, I shouldn't say anything back because he is so pious. She is upset that he implied 
that they do not have as much of a right to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And so when she got upset, she said that she was you, Umar radiallahu anhu, and your companions were with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam while we were far, while we were hungry, while he, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, mentored the companions and he provided with the companions and they didn't get all of that. So she went to the Prophet, peace be upon him, and she told him what Umar radiallahu anhu said and the Prophet, peace be upon him, replied with that Umar radiallahu anhu and his companions do not have more of a right over the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That the people of the ship, the Asma and the people of the ship, they migrated twice and Umar radiallahu anhu and his companions only migrated once. So the people of the ship have double the reward. The people who migrated with Asma have double the reward of the migration. And so because of her agency of voice, her voicing how she felt, not only was Umar radiallahu anhu taught, but the policy, the way that people interacted with these companions shifted. And Abu Musa al-Ash'ari, a great companion, would come over and over to Asma radiallahu anha asking, to narrate this hadith again and again. But Asma radiallahu anha, first she was married. And then when her husband was um, killed in battle, she got married again to Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. And she was there as Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu was um, in, you know, sick as he was dying. She was taking care of him. And when Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu passed away, she then later got married to Ali radiallahu anhu. The point is that the companions didn't see um, a, a woman who was widowed or divorced as some sort of stigma. It wasn't part of that culture, the Islamic culture. Unfortunately, in many Muslim majority cultures, it is a stigma today. So much so that women stay in marriages even when they are physically, emotionally being harmed. Now, what this means in terms of a, why this is important in terms of being men being financial providers is because of this. Number one, why does Allah give men that responsibility? Women have the incredible gift that Allah has given women the power and the vulnerability of bringing new life into the world. This is something that only women are honored with. Now, many women are never going to become mothers. Many women struggle with infertility. Many women don't want to be mothers. But we're talking about Islam addresses societal structures. In a societal structure, women who especially choose to become pregnant, who especially or are finding themselves pregnant in a marriage, and are now looking at the fact that they may not be able to work as they used to. Maybe they've already spoken, let's say a, a, a couple speaks to get married, and they choose that they're both going to be working, and that's something that they decide. Both the man and the one, woman both want to work in their marriage. Totally fine. Still, her money is her money. If she chooses to give part of that money to the, the marital home, then that's sadaqah from her, that's charity from her. And in some of the um, madhabs, she can also uh, put in a, um, a contract where he has to pay her back at some point so that she can receive the money back, even if she gives it. So let's say they get married and they decide that they both want to contribute to the household, but then she gets pregnant and she is finding herself unable to physically work and be pregnant at the same time. Many women can work and be pregnant at the same time. No problem. That's awesome. Alhamdulillah. But many can't. They have high-risk pregnancies. They have severe morning sickness. Whatever the reason, maybe she chooses after she gives birth that she wants to stay home and be with her baby. She doesn't have to choose that from an Islamic perspective. She doesn't have to. She and her husband can agree to what they would like to do together. But let's say that's what she wants to do and that's what she and her husband have agreed upon. Now, she is not required to have to work so that she can take care of herself when she's pregnant. She can take care of the baby when she has a baby. She can choose to take care of her children if she wants to. Again, this goes back to their relationship and they have a conversation about what their home is going to look like. But this provision of the husband being financially responsible gives her the option on what she's going to do when she's going through that process. Now, We're talking about a husband who is not a Nash's husband, who we're going to talk about in a second. We're talking about a husband who is supportive, who, who is financially caring. The reason for the mahar, as Ibn Abbas mentioned, one of the reasons is to make sure that a woman has her own financial safety plan. When you look at the concept of the mahar, a lot of times, many cultures see it as something symbolic. Oh, a mushaf. 
a, a copy of the Quran, uh, a, 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 a jar of honey to sweeten our relationship. Some, some look, at it as a, look at it as a symbolic gesture. Others look at it as something that's culturally seen as, you know, women in this culture typically ask for $10,000 or $20,000, that it's a typical number that the culture accepts. And sometimes you hear comments like, oh, that family is so, you know, it's like they, they're, it's so expensive to marry into their family. Their daughters ask for such a great mahar. But regardless of what the culture says about the mahar from an Islamic standpoint, the mahar has ways to be given so that it provides financial stability for a woman in marriage, so she has her own money, and also out of marriage in case there is a divorce. So for example, she can choose to say she wants, I'm going to put up a random number of $10,000. So let's say she says 10000 and a husband and a wife are right now just out of college. He doesn't have $10,000 to his name, but she can ask for a muqaddam and a muakhar, which means beforehand, before they get married, she can ask for $100 with the promise that every month she's going to be receiving a certain amount of money from that mahar, that marriage gift, until the next however many years that they're able to fulfill the contract. If he divorces his wife, this mahar becomes a debt that he owes her. So even in the case of a fesq, which is, for example, if a woman is experiencing domestic violence, she can receive a fesq, which is the dissolution of her marriage. It is a debt that he needs to pay her that money. So she is not ever financially completely dependent on his mercy when there is a situation that he is not fulfilling his due. Also, in terms of the mahar, um, beyond the mahar, she, some scholars talk about her being able to um, let's say she chooses that she doesn't want to work. She wants to be a housewife. She wants to be a stay-at-home mom. That's her choice. That's, that's what she wants to do before they get married. They make that decision. She can sign a contract with her husband, some of the scholars say, for asking that her, her cooking and her cleaning, which is not considered a requirement by many scholars that she has to do in, in the marriage, that she can be paid for these acts. So the point is that even a woman who is a housewife and a stay-at-home mom has her own financial you know, pocket that if she's in a situation where she is no longer safe in her marriage and she doesn't have her family to go back to, she has her own money that she's not dependent on anyone else for. Now, of course, the right Islamic marriage with the right, a husband correctly acting appropriately is taking care of his family. Even after a divorce, taking care of making sure that his children have everything that they need, but that's not the reality of our communities. And in an Islamic system, she should have either her father or her brother, which she doesn't always have, to support her. And in that case, the Islamic court system is supposed to provide for her from the treasury. That doesn't always, <laughs> that's not realistic, not in America, not in so many places that we live in. So that's why it's so important for us talking about our reality to know from an Islamic standpoint, she has the right to have her own money that she receives even as a housewife for cooking and cleaning, for breastfeeding her own child. These are all ways that she can receive finance, fi fi um, uh, financial support for, financial uh, independence for. And also when looking at this, women should invest that money. Dr. Tamara Gray, the Sheikha who founded um, Rabalta, she talks about a woman that she knew in Syria who took the mahar money that she received and she invested it in buying a taxi and hiring a driver. And so every month he made money as the driver and she received an amount. And so that mahar that started as a certain amount only grew in, in, in expanse. So being able to equip women in our communities to know that when you go into a marriage, of course we pray that it's so wonderfully financially secure, but also from an Islamic perspective, you have these rights so that you know that you have a den of money. And that could simply be because you want to keep giving in charity. It could be because you want to buy extra things that go beyond the family budget. But it's so that you know that you have something for yourself. Now, in addition to having this discussion on finances, it's important to talk about what kind of a husband um, the Islamic marriage uh, paints. Because when we look at the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, who of course was not by any means um, prosperous financially, 
the mothers of the believers lived very frugally. The prophet, peace be upon him, was so hungry that he put rocks on his stomach. So we're not talking about um, the ideal man having, you know, billions of dollars. Living in the Bay Area, we know that two income households are, are, are essential for the majority of of inhabitants of the Bay Area. It is impossible to live on one income for most families in the Bay and for many cities all around the world. And Islam has conversations on what that looks like, even that situation in marriages. I'm gonna close that section on finances only because there are other parts of the verse to get to. But the point is that a husband isn't required to provide lavishly unless, actually, I'm not gonna get into that, sorry. That's a different discussion too. There are discussions on that in fiqh as well. but. The point is that, of course, we hope that a husband and a wife live together with love and in harmony, but there are going to be cases in which that's not realistic, and Islam addresses that. So the next part of the verse talks about different qualities of a wife, and um, the, the scholars debate whether this is qualities that she shows to Allah, or if this is qual quali or these are qualities that she shows to her husband. But after that section, which we don't have time to get into, we're going to get into nushus. And what is nushus? This part of the verse is connected with darb. Darb is often translated as beat or strike lightly. So who is this talking about? A woman who commits nushus. Those you are certain, those you are absolutely certain have committed nushus. What is nushus? Let's talk about what the scholars say, what nushuz is from the husband to the wife, because it will make more clear what is nushuz from the wife to the husband. So Ibn Abidin and other, many other scholars from all of the madahib say different things. They say cursing her, if a husband curses his wife, if he verbally abuses her for the smallest of reasons, if he avoids being intimate with her for no reason when she wants intimacy, making her life difficult with regards to food and drink and clothing, showing a lack of respect and joking on her expense, backbiting her, making fun of her, taking a trip for fun without consulting with her first because it impacts her, hating her and making life difficult for her, boycotting her, irritating her, abusing her, not speaking to her, turning his back to her in bed, and obviously, in any way, physically harming her. So we can see that from the Malikis to the Shafi'is to the Hanbalis to the Hanafis, all of them have different interpretations of what a man who is considered Nash's does to his wife in ways that harm her. And that can range from hating her to being emotionally or physically or sexually abusive to her. It's very important to mention verbally. I hope that Maybe we caught on to how many times they said making fun of her, boy backbiting against her. Those are considered acts of har her husband harming her. Islamic law doesn't just take into account physical harm. It also takes into account emotional harm. So when the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, says, la darar wa la dirar, that there's no harm and there's no reciprocation of harm, there are so many examples of that meaning and including emotional harm. Sometimes women say, oh, it's not that bad. He doesn't hit me. Oh, it's not that bad. He's not, he's not, you know, subhanAllah, actively physically harming her. But emotional harm is great. That's psychological dam psychologically damaging. Children see that and they grow up thinking that that's normal. And that's far from acceptable from an Islamic standpoint. So when we see what the husband looks like when he's committing new shoes, now let's look at the verse when it talks about a woman committing new shoes. This means that from Imam al-Shafi'i, he explains that when she is committing new shoes, it means it's not in retaliation to him doing something to her. Many times in a marriage, a husband does something, a wife reacts. A wife does something, a husband reacts. The wife does something, the husband is upset, he reacts. The husband does something, the wife is upset, she reacts. It's a constant reaction to something someone did. And that's the general feeling in the house. You don't feel the type of tranquility that the Quran talks about. This is not nushuz. The Imam al-Shafi'i says a woman who does something in a marriage, not in retaliation to something her husband has done, 
And she wants to stay in this marriage because again, divorce is always an option. She can ask for a khala, which is um, her asking for divorce. So it's not because she doesn't want to stay in the marriage. She wants to stay in the marriage and it's not in retaliation to him, but she does different actions that cause harm and threatens their marital um, space. Now, when that happens, the Quran provides three options on what to do. It's a step-by-step -step process. But first, in order to understand that process, we have to go to the context in where this verse was revealed. This was re verse was revealed in, as we know, the society of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, in which women were from a culture that used to be buried alive. Baby girls would be born and they would be buried by their own fathers with the consent at times of their mothers. We're looking at a society in which women were married 20 to 30 women at a time to one man in a culture in which women were inherited like property because they were seen as property. Umar radiallahu anhu said that we used to think of women as absolutely nothing until what Allah revealed of what he revealed and divided what he divided. So we're talking about a society which literally saw women as nothing. And in this society, we know that darb, and in this context, which I'm going to say, which was an actual physical beating, was seen as not simply acceptable because Ibn Ashur, who is a commentator of the Quran and a fiqh, he talks about a woman in this time period saw hitting physical domestic violence as acceptable. Obviously, when you're from a culture that sees you as property, you're, you would look at it as acceptable. But also, we need to realize that it wasn't simply acceptable. It was seen as manly. It was seen as chivalrous. How do we know that? Because we look at Arabic poetry before the Quran was revealed. And in Arabic poetry, before the Quran was revealed, we have the story of a mother who's giving advice to her daughter. And she's saying that you are going to get married, go into your new marital home, take the weapons of your husband, break them in half, throw them all over the floor and see what his reaction is. If he does not physically beat you for breaking all of his weapons and throwing them on the floor, his you know tools of manhood, then he is not going to defend you. Do you see how this mother saw it to her daughter? That if he doesn't physically beat you for uh, challenging his manhood, then he's not gonna defend you outside of his own home. So the way that they saw this was a sign of, her, of a husband having this prowess, not only to defend internally the home, but as well as externally. So what does the Quran do? The Quran comes and limits and, um, uh, uh, oh, sorry, I just forgot the word in English. Uh, gets rid of is the, the gets rid of domestic violence. How so? Looking at a society in which even women saw this as something chivalrous to those women, especially particularly amongst the Bedouins, Ibn Ashur mentions, the Quran comes and gives guidelines on what needs to be done before even enacting the concept of darb. And we're going to get to what that means. The first one is that a husband needs to communicate to his wife how he is feeling. The first one is that they speak to one another. Now, uh, Ibn Kathir, who is a great commentator of the Quran, he mentions that a husband and a wife must live with one another in mawadda and rahma, as a verse that is on like every wedding card mentions. Mawadda is not I mean, love, of course, it is love, but it's not just love. It's active love. It's love in action. Mawadda actually means actively showing love. The five, lang lang the five love languages, which are so famous, it is actively showing love through every sort of love language. Mawadda is active love. And Ibn Kathir mentions that if he's not going to live with her in love, then at least it needs to be in mercy. Because there are going to be times that a couple continues to live together, even when they hate each other but it needs to be done with mercy. That life together needs to be with mercy. So scholars mention that the first part of responding to the act of new shoes from a husband to a wife is by talking to her with gentleness, not yelling at her, not screaming at her, not cursing her, saying, I have seen you do such and such a wrong. And can you please stop? 
So literally mentioning the exact issue and asking her to stop. Now, if that doesn't work, it uh, goes on to the next step. And the next step is that he's supposed to leave the marital bed. Now, many couples already are not intimate with one another, so that could be a relief to her. But the point is that it's supposed to move from communicating, and that takes time. It's not, I tried this in the morning, and by the evening, he's going to turn away in bed. It takes time, which means the anger, the hurt, the frustration, by this time, unless it's an act that is continually happening, it should have calmed down. The second step is walking away from the marital bed. Again, by this time, it should have calmed down. But let's say it hasn't. Let's say it's persisting. What is the third point? This is darb. Now, darb is understood by scholars in two different ways. Some look at it as a physical action and others look at it as um, an, a, an emotional reaction. So the physical action of darb. Darb has so many different meanings in Arabic. It can mean to travel or to depart. It could mean to block or to prevent. It can mean to neglect and to abandon. It could mean to make the truth and falsehood, to make truth and falsehood evident and distinguishable. It can mean to cut or to strike or to slash or to slap. It could be to separate and even more. So darb itself has so many different meanings. Now, the scholars who look at darb and say it's a physical meaning, restricting the concept of darb in the society that it was revealed in, talk about the conditions for it. And this is very triggering to talk about for anyone who is involved with any sort of work or who has experienced domestic violence, because even with the conditions, which mean it cannot leave a mark, it cannot be on the face, it cannot leave a bruise or a red mark, it cannot cut. The scholars like Ibn Abbas, for example, he took a shoelace and he went like this, or a miswak. Other scholars say the end of a garment is what is supposed to be used to do a lot. Other scholars say to take a, a, a pack of wadded up napkins, and that's what lot is. So if you take the end of a garment or a pack of wadded up napkins, and you take that, and you hit someone or yourself, it's not painful when you do this, but it's still emotionally humiliating. It's still hurtful. Just the concept of it can be harmful. And that is why scholars say that if this, even with all these conditions, even if it's symbolic, even using the end of a garment or a bunch of napkins, even if that could be emotionally humiliating, it could embarrass her. It could cause her not to want to come back to the relationship because this verse is meant to reconcile between spouses. The purpose of the verse, the objective is reconciliation. How do we know that? Because this is a woman who is not reacting to her husband, who wants to stay in her marriage, but is doing something, which we didn't talk about actually all the conditions of what Nushu's is, because it can range for so many different things. But the point, and I'm so sorry, just because we're, this is just like a, a, a truncated version of the tafsir. But the point is that this is a marriage they both want to stay in. They want to reconcile between one another. We tried communication. We tried a symbolic gesture of, uh, sorry, of leaving the bed. Now, even if it's a symbolic gesture, Imam and Nawawi, <laughs> so many different scholars, like um, Sheikh Jamal uh, Suleiman. There are so many scholars of our past who said, even if emotionally it would harm her, this symbolic act, it is haram to use. It is prohibited. Al-Hattabi al-Maliki, it is prohibited. It is haram to use this part of the verse if it doesn't make a woman feel like she wants to reconcile with her husband. Now, Ibn Ashur, again, the scholar that we mentioned earlier, he says that sometimes in some societies, men are not going to have spiritual connections with God. They are not going to have physical restraint. They're going to see this verse and they are going to say that it gives them the right to hit their wife without thinking about all of the commentary we just discussed. And in that case, the authorities must make an edict that no man is allowed to use this verse because men will not have the ability to discern how they can use it in a way that reconciles between their family versus doing it out of anger. Because darb out of anger is haram. Darb out of emotional frustration is haram. It's supposed to be a tool of reconciliation. 
which in our context might not make any sense, but the Quran is forever. It made sense in their culture. It might make sense in another culture that exists right now in our time. It might make sense in a culture 500 years from now. The Quran is forever. But if it doesn't make sense to our context, to our family unit, scholars have said it is impermissible to use because the point is reconciliation. If it's not going to bring back a couple back together, it is not permissible to use this part of the verse. Now, even saying all of that, a Dasuki, who is a Maliki judge from like hundreds of years ago, he had cases of women who would come to him complaining of domestic violence. And what he would issue is that the husband if, of this um, relationship would be physically beaten because of him physically beating his, his wife. So the, ret the retribution was to physically assault the husband to realize the pain that he has caused his wife. And of course, a woman has the right for a thus. She's already in front of a judge. She has the right to ask for the dissolution of a marriage. And in that case, the, the, even if she doesn't have the financial support of whether it's the ex-husband or the family to provide for her in whatever the situation is, it's always situational, then there's always the court who can require that she has a stipulated amount of wealth that she's given. So she's not financially left alone. But the point is, even if this ayah is looked at as a, um, uh, a symbolic tap, even if it's an emotional, even if it causes emotional wounds, it's not allowed to be used. And the other understanding of this verse is from Alta ibn Abi Rabah, who is one of the foremost um, scholars of the Tabi'in who came right after the companions, radiallahu anhum. And he is a student of Ibn Abbas, who was considered the commentator of the Quran of the companions, radiallahu anhum. And he mentions that this verse is not to be understood physically. Because the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, as Aisha mentioned, never harmed a woman. He never hit a woman. He never hit a servant. The Prophet ﷺ said, by what right does one of you hit your wife? By what right? The Prophet ﷺ never hit a woman. He never sanctioned for uh, marriages. The Prophet ﷺ didn't, did not appreciate for marriages to look like this. And he said that the best of men are not like this. And these are just um, summarizing the ahadith. So this is not from the example of the prophet, peace be upon him. So al taws understanding of this verse is not a physical one. It's that it means to show that he's angry by expressing his emotional anger and to separate himself, to walk away, to separate himself from um, his spouse. And finally, the end of this ayah ends with inna Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions two of his names. That he is in Allah Kana Ali and Kabira, the most high and all great. Why? Ibn Kathir mentions that Allah ends this verse with these two names. He is the most high. He is higher than anyone who chooses to abuse their, their partner because abuse is not about her doing something wrong. It's not about her uh, messing up. It's about power and control. It is him losing, not losing, it is his. Uh, it is, it is an abuse of power and control. And so when a man feels himself so high and mighty, who is higher than him? Allah. When it's about power and control, who has more power and control? Allah. Who is greater than this man? It is Allah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Ali and Kabira, the most high and the all great. And in that context, Ibn Kathir, the commentator of the Quran mentions, it means that Allah is the wali of woman. Allah is the one who supports women. Allah is the one who's got the back of women. This is a threat. It is Allah threatening men that if they use this concept in a way that harms the relationship, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is on the side of women. And note that when we're talking about this ayah, there are verses of the Quran like pray, establish prayer, give zakat, go for hajj. They are rulings. They are religious rulings that must be implemented. This verse is not a legal ruling. It is a cultural ruling. There are verses of the Quran that are not legal, but they are cultural. What does that mean? It means that women can put in their contract that they do not want someone to implement a particular type, some, something. The next verse, the, uh, I believe it's the verse immediately after this. Yes, um, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says 
to bring people from both parties of their families or other people who can kind of be mediators, who can be, um, you know, therapy, go to therapy, find people in your family who can support you to process your pain, go to professionals. The Quran literally talks about different forms of mediation in the verse immediately after this. But we look at the example of Atika, radiallahu anha. She was the wife of Omar, radiallahu anhu. When she got married to Omar, she stipulated in her marriage contract that he could not physically harm her. And then after he passed away, radiallahu anhu, he, she got married to Azubair, radiallahu anhu. She put in her contract, radiallahu anha, to Zubair that he cannot physically harm her. If this verse was about physical harm, can you put in your contract something that goes against the Quran? No. So that means this verse isn't about physically harming someone because women amongst the Prophet, peace be upon him, themselves put in their contract, it is not permissible to harm me in their marriage contract itself. So when we look at the whole system of Islamic law, there are so many ways in which women are supposed to be cared for, supported, that a woman can choose if she wants to work or stay home and be with her children and she has the support to do that. But if, God forbid, there's ever a situation where as women have approached me and told me that her husband has put a knife to her neck and she went to her local imam and he said, go home and pray and be patient and try to seduce him. I was sick to my stomach hearing this because unfortunately, so many of our amazing individuals and religious leadership have been trained in different areas of fiqh, but not in this one. And that's why it's so important to realize when you talk to a scholar and they are not able to give you 700 interpretations of what something means, maybe that's not their field. Maybe their field is in the fiqh of something else. Maybe their, their focus has been in a different part of Islamic law. Islamic law is enormous. We have lawyers for immigration lawyers. We have lawyers for companies. We have lawyers for everything. Islamic law has fields in every part. So when we hear people of knowledge, maybe making a statement that sounds terrifying, maybe that's not their field. Or maybe they're quoting someone who held that particular opinion. But there are scholars who have so many opinions that reflect the axioms of Islamic law, which are the sanctity of life, the sanctity of, 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 of um of intelligence, the sanctity, the preservation of family, of faith, of so many different parts of an individual's being. Because Islamic law cares for our physical self, our mental self, our intimate selves, and our spiritual selves. And that's why a verse like this is intended to bring peace to a family. And if ever not seen like that, then remember the next verse, which are different ways for a family to come back together with the support of other people. And I know that we have, inshallah, dedicated a little bit of time for questioning. So I'm going to end here. Subhanakallah. Ma ma mashallah. Jazakallah khairan, Maryam. For such a beautiful, insightful overview of um, verse 434. Subhanallah. Mm -hmm. um, and, and just, um, mashallah, how much protection we get, you know, with the physical, the emotional, the, you've just kind of nailed it. Um, but unfortunately in the reality of things, and this is kind of why Nissa exists is because of course, it's just ignored most of the yes. time, you know, that's the reality of the situation. Um, but of course, subhanAllah, the Quran is a blueprint for us. And we know that we are protected in every possible way. Um, you mentioned, Mashal, you've pretty much covered everything that I could possibly have thought of asking you, but oh. just in the last few moments, you've just mentioned um, Sabbath. This is something that comes up very often. What does it mean to be patient? Like you said, many people will just send pe women away and say, you know, be patient. It, it will be okay. Just, mm -hmm. just sit back and Allah is there for you, right? right, just, right. Like, just, just be patient with the situation and it will get better for you. Mm -hmm. What does it mean to have Sabbath and how can we proactively have that patience. Patience is not um, allowing someone to beat you or to physically and emotionally uh, consistently neglect and harm you and then making dua and then wondering why Allah isn't answering your dua. Many times when we tell women just pray harder, they don't wonder what's wrong with their situation and what change they should make. Of course, it's already very difficult to be in that situation. Many times they have, they have experienced years of psychological trauma Sometimes they come from backgrounds where maybe that was the reality of their family. 
And now they're going through it with their own nuclear, their, their own husband and their new nuclear family. And so when they're told to be patient and pray, they're wondering why isn't Allah listening to me? They start questioning why are my du'as not being answered? Is it because I'm not a good enough believer? She's not a good enough believer as she's being beat, as she's being psychologically constantly being told that she's all of these disgusting things that she's been told. And, and it's because Allah's not answering her? No, it's because when we make du'a, we also need to take action. And mm -hmm. it is very hard to tell a, a, a survivor, a victim, that you need to take action. And we shouldn't have to put it on her to be the one to take action because it shouldn't be happening in the first place. But the reality is that when someone comes to us and they tell us, I mean, subhanAllah, when they tell us that they're going through this, us telling them be patient is never the answer, ever. We should never say you need to be patient. What we should say is how can we support you by giving you all of these resources? Here is Nessa's hotline. Here are all the other resources that you can have. And my, my response to you is how can I be patient, me, as a supporter of you, in helping you explore your options so that we can figure out what is the best path for you to take. Of course, we need to take into account the fact that there may be children in the home. And I've had women who are being physically beaten regularly, who are hiding in the bathroom so that her husband doesn't harm her. These are so real. I hear from cases like this of women who have approached one person after another who are simply told to hold on. Hold on for what? For the sake of their children. For the sake of their children not to have a broken home. This is not a broken home. You being physically beat, your children being physically beat is not a broken home. For them to see that their, 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 their father, that this is acceptable, that they deserve this, what we need to do as a community is, as a community, we need to have patience as we change the structures of our community right. so that when we have chutzpahs, when we have regular community discussions, when we overemphasize with, you know, of course, modesty is so important in our religion, but the obsession over hijab we need to have patience in changing that narrative. So we are obsessed over ensuring that women and men are not ever in a position when they are victims of domestic violence. And we know that even men are victims of domestic violence in our own community. We know that boys are, are uh, victims of sexual abuse in our own community and they can't tell anyone because they are men. And so when we change that culture for our entire community and we have patience through that change, then we can create a community which honors men and women who are going through this, which honors the children who are going through this and, and who can support them through this process. So I recommend for a person who ever is told to be patient, to turn that question back around and to ask them, are you going to be patient while you are beaten? Would you be patient? And what would you, what would you do? Because really no woman, no man, no child should ever be in a situation where they are told to be patient for being beaten. That is absolutely unacceptable. In Islamic law, it is unacceptable. In, in American law, it is simply unacceptable in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Thank you, Maryam. I, I appreciate that. Um, we have a question in the, the chat box actually from Saha, who is our program manager. I don't know if you're able to see it. Um, okay. Of course, she says, um, we, I mean, we greatly appreciate you clearly describing the rights and responsibilities of couples, especially, of course, um, you know, husbands and wives and, and how Surah 434 talks about and outlines um, the family relations, in particular the relationship of a husband and wife, like you had um, mentioned. In the event that these guidelines are not followed, which is unfortunately the case in so many, so many, and this is of course when Nissa comes in, what resources are available for women to obtain support from the Muslim leadership with matters of divorce, um, children, financial support. Um, she's obviously been with Nissa for since 2006. Um, and, and we do find it very difficult mm -hmm. to leverage in the right resources um, when we are in, 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 you know, in cases of domestic violence, unfortunately, mm -hmm. as of course, as you're seeing the visibility of Nissa is growing, so are the needs. Mm -hmm. um, they've always course. been there. Of course, we've got those women, subhanAllah, who are brave enough to leave the home and, 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 you know, we, we keep them in the shelters or, you know, they're able to kind of, leave that situation but many the majority do not like you said they hide in bathrooms they still endure the pain the suffering um so uh, you know just kind of brainstorming almost like as of course we want to be more visible we want people to know that this 
place exists, Nissa does exist. But how can we even make it more accessible? Um, of course, leveraging in more professional support, because this is not just for people who want to do good in an organization. We really do, like you said, have the right kind of support for these women and children in particular. Like you said, subhanAllah, our resources are now we are, you know, reaching out to those children as well. We're trying to support them in the best possible way that we can. Um, but in an ideal situation or I mean, what, what would you recommend? What would you suggest, Mariam? It's, you know, one of the challenges is that everything is being built from the ground up right now. And the ground for the Muslim community often looks like spaces where women are not even necessarily welcome into the masjid. Right. Or if they are welcome into the masjid, they are afterthoughts. There are masjid, many masjid, um, where, mashallah, they have, you know, large women sections and they have facilities for women to be supported. But their needs are not reflected on the board composition. And even having women on board positions, their voice is not often held with as much weight as the men's voice on those boards. And so that, of course, impacts the policy of the masjid, which creates community culture. When we have policies, we create culture. When our culture is not reflective of the needs of the attendees of the masjid space, of the Muslim community, when we are not able to come to the masjid, when we are going through the millions of things that young people go through right now, from depression to suicide attempts, to struggling with their identity in every single way, to being abused by their own family members. There are a million, a million struggles that young people face, that women face, that men face in our community that are not being reflected in the chutzpahs, which are consistently recycling the same things a lot of times. When they come to women, they often have to do with the importance of modesty, marriage, and motherhood, which are so beautiful and so wonderful and so important, but literally not everything that a woman goes through. And so when that is the community narrative, it does become so much more difficult to include conversations on domestic violence because it's seen like the exception and not the rule. And right. we pray that it's the exception and not the rule. But the problem is, even when it's the exception, we don't have systems of accountability to to, to, to support the process. So without the systems of accountability in place, because there isn't an urgency felt, because it's not reflected in even the most basic day, weekly conversation of the Muslim community, then where do we expect, how do we expect like the Khalil Center or Peaceful Families Project or Amal's Shelter or um, Maristan with Dr. Rania Awad, Sheikh Rania Awad's um, uh, mental health program, like uh, organization. All of these programs are seen as resources instead of pillars. And what we need to do is shift the way we have these conversations so that they are literally pillars. That as we you know, financially support Masajid, we hold Masajid accountable and we ask them, how are these organizations integrated into your masjid? That this donation to this masjid actually is conditioned upon this organization receiving this much starlight, spotlight focus in this many khutbahs a year, in this many programs a year. The point is that right now, we don't live in the Islamic law system where we have judges and we have courts and we have places. We have organizations. We have the police and we have organizations for the Muslim community. And the police is a very difficult, dis different dis discussion completely because of course, then we have to talk about all of the realities of power and oppression and race. And that impacts Black Muslims in our community. It impacts so many Muslims in our community. So on one hand, we have a, a, um, a structure in Islamic law, which is supposed to support these things, but we don't have that. So we have organizations to rely on and we are not supporting our organizations because they're simply an organization to go to for support versus they need to be part of the pillar of the community. And in order to do that, we have to shift the way that we look at the function of a masjid and the community in general, which again goes back to sub -up. That's a very long process. And <laughs> I wish that I had more of an answer to that, but. Oh. No, that's, you know, that's, that's beautiful, Mariam. Honestly, that's very, um, it's very valid what you've just said and absolutely just collaborating more with these organizations that are set up. It's definitely more than, you know, um, it's, it's more than an amazing start to do that. And we are definitely doing a lot more outreach and connecting more to professionals who can help in these situations. But absolutely, the um, the dialogue needs to be um, a lot more um, current. We need to, you know, 
speak at the community level, speak with massages. And alhamdulillah, we have been pushing for that more. There is definitely more outreach. Um, there's definitely a need for it. But alhamdulillah, you know, it's not like I said, it's not a problem that just exists with, within a certain community. It's a global issue. It's yes. something that, you know, affects women and men like you said and children and on on some level and um but like I said can I, yes I'm sorry can I just uh, ask a follow-up question um salam alaikum this is Saha. Saha. Uh, so I you know I what I, I I think what um what I usually look for and this is where I, I get stuck is when uh when I have a client who's seeking support filing for an Islamic divorce, mm-hmm. and when she you know reaches out to the resources that are available, there's a lot of you know I guess dismissing of the DV and 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 I've had a few clients who are really you know devastated by the process of how difficult it was mm-hmm. um, to obtain that. So I, I guess I wanted to know: Do you know of any you know any organization resource that I would be able to refer refer the, these ladies to who will have an understanding of DV and help them file for an Islamic divorce currently I actually have two three clients who are actually searching for that the, the only organizations that I personally know of um, are, are your organization and ML's um, ML's shelter um, as well as the Peaceful Families Project and Maristan, Khalil Center. Those are the only ones mm-hmm. that I know of. And I know that many of them work with imams and they work with sheikhs so that they're able to um, help facilitate mm-hmm. the process. Of course, um, uh, Swiss, which is suhaibweb.com, Imam, imam Suhaibweb used to be the imam of um, the MCA. And uh, mashallah, you know, these are, these are imams who are on the forefront of supporting women in helping them process issues like this. Um, and, and alhamdulillah that we have so many of them in our community, but as you mentioned, we also have so many who, who dismiss domestic violence. Mm -hmm. And I think that's partly because they just really have, this is not their field, which is not an excuse. I don't know if you should be an imam. I mean, like the thing is, the problem is we, we make the imam, the, the, the judge, the Islamic, in the Islamic system, he has become the judge, the Muslim therapist. He's become the psychological counselor. He's become everything when he's his real you know focus should be the spiritual lens which of course all of those things are impacted by that but they're not he's not supposed to be the judge the executioner the jury he's not supposed to be all of it but in our community he has become that because we don't have the system set up for it and so i think part of the process and i don't know uh, personally to provide any other resources than the ones i mentioned unfortunately i wish i did and that's just my own fault it's not that they don't exist perhaps more do exist um, and Sheikha Rania Awad is maybe a great resource, inshallah, because of her specialty and her work in this field, um, especially looking at um, mental mental health in the Muslim field, in the Muslim community, and doing so much research in that. But I think the point is that uh, we need to move away from a uh, a, uh, a structure in which uh, Nissa is coming and saying, "Let me introduce myself to your masjid," where instead the masjids are. We are we are outreaching and we are bringing in all these organizations. The onus of responsibility shouldn't be on an organization to come in and say, "Let's provide our resources." Every message should say, "This is this is so critical in our community." Our imam is not trained for this because most imams are not, and that's not a fault on the imam. They were never supposed to be all of these things. And instead, here is the process that we have in place that we are working with lawyers, social workers, and we are working with uh, we are working with organizations that. Is, explicitly do this work to have a streamlined process on what a woman goes through. We don't have that right now. We have, you know, women who are coming to you, may Allah bless you so much for therapy, and then not knowing where to go after that, because we just don't have that system. And that's, I think that goes back to the fact that we don't, we are not reflecting the needs of our community yet. And inshallah, we will one day, um, but it's it's a process to get there. and, And I'm as angry and frustrated as you are in that process. We're, you know, very grateful. I know we're at 11.05 literally now. Um, I I just want to honestly, just from the bottom of my heart, say thank you so, so much for joining us Mm. and imparting really such amazing knowledge. I've learned so much. I've taken notes as as I've been listening to you. Um, SubhanAllah, so much of this that honestly, um, things get misinterpreted along the way. Mm -hmm. You know, people have their own ideas about things, but mashallah, you just went, right into it in so much detail and depth and um you honest like I said um you answered questions that I had and you, you just you just kind of knew and you just um 
mashallah just um, went above and beyond and oh, and i really really do value your time you being with us today um i i know that inshallah hopefully in, in the future we can have you back again inshallah um, speaking but thank you so much for just carving time out for for us today and mm -hmm. speaking with us and being so beautifully prepared and um just so sincere and genuine it with was, how you communicated everything. So jazakallah khair. And I can't khair. really thank you enough. No, no, it was such an honor. Thank you for the work that you do, mashallah. There, the work you do is so important. And uh, both of you, like, subhanAllah, your entire organization, you're asking me, like, what are the resources? And I'm like, Nissa is a resource I give everyone. So may Allah bless you. May Allah reward you. Make your work so successful. I mean, Make I mean, your work completely unnecessary. I mean, and, <laughs> and facilitate I mean, the best uh, for, for, for you. Thank you so much for having I me. Mean,